Hello everyone, I'm Judith and now we are going to be continue to discover the endless beauty of chess studies with John Nunn again. Welcome John and uh, I'm very happy that you joined and you're going to be showing some more beautiful studies from the chess artistry competition which we had as part of the Global Chess Festival this year 2021. Uh, of course, I think many people know about you that you were a fantastic player in the 80s and 90s. That's, that was your peak, I think, top 10 player. And, uh, and also, of course, you started to have, uh, during your career, your solving and composing. But I want to be focusing a little bit more on the practical part of it. Do you remember when was the first time that you were solving puzzle and uh, not not even the necessarily the first the first time when you felt or did you feel any time that it influenced your practical play over the board you had found some kind of idea which resembled of a study like position. Uh, well, chess end games have always fascinated me. It's always been the favourite part of the game for me. Um, of course, like all grandmasters, I spent a lot of time studying the openings because. Uh, but that was mainly because I wanted to win games, not because I found openings particularly exciting. But end games, I found much more interesting because one thing about openings is that there are fashions. You know, you suddenly have everybody playing Sveshnikov Sicilians and then everybody plays the Nidorf or something and it all changes. Whereas if you learn something about the end game, then it's just true forever. You know, these, you can study these 19th century analyses and they're just as true today as they were the day they were created. So end games always had a fascination for me. And in a way, the purest type of end game is the end game study, because it's normally composed to demonstrate in a very clear form one particular idea. Over the board end games are rather messy and complicated and people make mistakes, particularly if they have only 30 seconds of move like they do these days. Um, but with the end game study, you get perfect play, you get beauty, you get something that's um, really striking. And so I have always had a, a weakness for end game studies. Um, some people might say, well, if you'd spent more time on the openings, you would have won some more games. But honestly, I don't regret it now. Well, I know exactly very well how much uh, you love end games. And I remember meeting you in Vienna in uh, back in the early 90s, I think it was 91, when you showed some examples and some... Uh, positions, which was absolutely very practical, king, king, rook, each of the player and only one pawn. And then that time you started to work with engines to develop understanding for yourself at first, I think. And later on, you started to write things, books about them. What has changed uh, and how much it changed on your understanding? your vision about uh, Endgame itself, and how did it develop uh, further up to today, 30 years later? Yes, but it was a revelation. Um, first of all, um, Endgame table bases were created with only four pieces on the board. And of these, the most interesting were probably King and Rook against King and Knight, and King and Queen against King and Rook. Now, I remember one of the very first, well, uh, the American computer scientist Ken Thompson was instrumental in developing these first databases. And King and Queen against King and Rook was something that you just resigned at one point. But then uh, with the database, he challenged Walter Brown to win in 50 moves with King and Queen against King and Rook. And uh, the first attempt, poor Walter couldn't manage it, although he did it later. Um, and this showed that there was kind of a lot of subtleties in end games that perhaps people hadn't appreciated and later on five man table bases appeared and the ending of two bishops against knight which had been thought to be drawn for like a hundred over a hundred years was shown in fact to be winning and hardly anybody had suspected this i think the english study composer john roycroft was the only one who suggested that it might be a win before the database was created 
And so even these early databases, which appeared, as you say, um, late 80s, early 90s, um, produced some new discoveries. Then the six-man table bases and now seven-man table bases were finished so that using a, an app, you can enter any position with seven men, including the two kings, and get an instant evaluation of whether it's a win or a draw and how many moves it takes. And right now they're working on the eight-man um, table bases, which have been done for certain positions. But the complexity of some of these positions is beyond human understanding. Some of these positions require over 500 moves to win. And if you play over the 500 moves, you can play over the first 400, and the position looks basically the same as it did at the beginning, even though you're apparently 80% of the way towards the win. You just can't see the difference. You know, one piece is on a slightly different square. You know, so what? And so, so the problem isn't creating the data, it's making some kind of attempt to understand what the data is telling you. Yes, this, uh, I think, changed uh, a huge uh, on the sport, to tell you the truth. Obviously, we didn't have uh, uh, adjourned games anymore because it was absolutely did not make any sense because you just enter it into the database and you get the answer even if in some position you don't understand exactly why and how you exactly win. But uh, what do you think nowadays? How much top players are uh, using endgame study to solve them, to practice and keep themselves in shape? Or they are just solving them for their pleasure and it gives uh, spending a lot of uh, fun time with them? I suspect they're doing it mainly for pleasure. Um, famous trainer Mark Dvoretsky always uh, encouraged players to use in-game studies for training purposes. But to be honest, I'm not really sure how many of them actually do it. I think they just look at these studies for fun. <laughs> yes, which is also uh, quite astonishing for me that uh, chess studies, end-game studies, it is something that gives pleasure from amateur players all the way to the very top. I remember when uh, uh, Gary Kasparov was in Budapest visiting our festival and we had a dinner together. Immediately he came up and showed me some incredible, beautiful one. And he was like smiling like a child because it, it gave them pleasure to relive the moment, how beautiful it is and share it with other people. And uh, also with Kremnik, I have the same. Sometimes we are sending to each other uh, studies just because you're happy solving it, seeing it, and you want to share it with someone else who can also appreciate those. But uh, so this is something very interesting for me that I, I've never met with any player, especially with from masters to up to, to the very top world champions. And anybody would say that, no, I don't care. I'm not interested. They always cheer up and say, yeah, they're so beautiful. Kasparian, this one, that one. Who is your yeah. favorite composer, by the way? Well, um, from the from the olden times, you mentioned Kasparian, and he he of course was also a strong over the board player. Um, yeah, I think my favorite composer must be must be him, because these days there is a with the use of computers, um, there's a lot of very good composers around. Um, Pervakov uh, produced a number of absolutely stunning studies and also some of the younger composers like Minsky um, doing a great deal of work and in fact the standard of study composing today I would say is higher than it's ever been in the past so it's uh, something that where there's been a lot of progress well if you mentioned already Minsky he was also one of the great fantastic composer who took part in this competition and uh, I think you want to share with us his study also, which was jointly made with another composer. So let's see on the chessboard. Yeah, sure. This uh, study was composed by um, Avni and Minsky, a joint composition. It gained a second honorable mention in the tourney. I should explain that the award was divided into three sections, prizes, honourable mentions and commendations. So this gained one of the high honourable mentions. It's white to play and win. And you 
position is a little, little bit um, unbalanced, so we need to take a, a look to grasp what's going on. As I say, white is to play. Both the white rooks are attacked. One um, attacked by the black rook and one attacked by the black pawn. Black has a queen in the corner, which is capable of giving annoying checks on either a8 or h1. There's no point in white uh, taking the rook immediately because his own rook is hanging. So the correct first move is to give a check with the pawn, forcing black to decide where he's going to play his king. If black plays his king to the e-file, then white wins in a rather boring fashion. He just gives a check with this rook, making it safe so it's no longer attacked by the pawn. That moves his king again and white snaps off uh, the black rook. Black of course has these checks with the king, but white, um, white king is quite safe. He can answer the check on h1 with king b2 and check on a8. He can meet, for example, by playing king b1 or by perhaps putting, putting rook in the way. So white then would win on material. Two rooks and bishop are worth quite a lot more than a queen. So black cannot um, answer the pawn check with uh, king to the e file. It has to go somewhere else. King to g8 is a mistake because white takes the rook. Black, say, gives a check. White moves his king. And now black has no time to take the rook on c2 because white's already threatening mate on the back rank. So having eliminated those possibilities, Let's see the best move, which is to play the king to f8, so that the rook coming to the back rank later won't deliver an immediate checkmate. So it's no good now for white to play rook takes rook. Black just checks with his queen and then on h1 and takes the rook on c2 and there's no win. So if we just go back to the position after king f8, white has to play a better move than simply taking the rook. And the move he plays is rather surprising. He, in fact, sacrifices his rook. Now, white is skewering the black king and queen, so there's no choice. Black must take the rook. And now the point of this preliminary sacrifice is revealed, because now the rook is not on c5. This bishop move is a check. And indeed, it's a discovered attack. It discovers an attack by the rook on c2 against the rook on c8. So at first it looks like the whole thing is just over now because black moves his king somewhere, white, well, if he moves it to g8, it's mate in one move. If he moves it to e8, white takes both the rook and the queen. But black has a surprising defense. His rook just went from c5 to c8, and now it does what we call a switch back. It goes back from c8 to c5. Um, Sometimes people do switch backs and over the board play, but normally that's just, just because they realise their last move was a mistake and they effectively want to take it back. But here it is actually the best move. This is quite a clever defence because white now has to take this rook with one or other of his pieces and whichever piece he takes it with, he blocks the other one. There's a technical name for this, it's called a Novotny Interference. If white takes with the bishop, black just moves his king, and now there's no skewer with the rook coming to the back rank because the bishop is blocking the rook. So if we go back to here, the correct move is to take with the rook with white's own rook. And now, now I want to interrupt. Oh, for, sorry, go ahead. I want to interrupt for just a second because this is also something I feel, and only now after I retired from competitive chess. I understood that I think by solving many of the studies, I became a better defender. Because in studies, it's not only who is winning the game is making the incredible good moves. It's contrary. Actually, it's a composition between white and black moves. So when white is developing the fantastic ideas, at the same time, the other side is always having some hidden very nice saving opportunities and in many occasions for example here in this situation also i feel that you can say if you're playing a game oh everything works out for for white right which actually it's true but still there are some saving ideas and uh, i think in my games i was doing a lot of times that when people expected me to resign and maybe i should have 
that's fair. <laughs> but still, in some other cases, it was not embarrassing and it was not so bad not to resign. And I saved some of the positions because I had my fighting spirit. And I think because I understood that there are situations which looks absolutely hopeless, but you can still find some uh, resource. And please show because this is so amazing what's coming up. Yeah, actually, that's a good point you make, because thinking back over my own games, there were definitely some cases where having my, my eyes opened by the unexpected possibilities of in-game studies helped me in over-the-board play. I remember I had a, an enemy against John van der Veel one year at Vicon's A, where I couldn't stop his past porn. And I couldn't think <laughs> of any way to face the game. And I thought, oh, no, am I going to resign? And then I thought until I had like a few minutes left on my clock. And suddenly I saw this amazing draw where I could give up the rook for the pawn and draw with bishop and two pawns against rook and bishop. A kind of incredible position. And I think I wouldn't have found that defensive resource if I hadn't thought, seen so many examples in endgame studies of apparently hopeless positions being saved by totally unexpected ideas. So, yeah, they kind of help I'm yeah, I'm happy that you also actually brought up a concrete example, which I'm going to be checking later on myself. <laughs> but I really believe that the defensive skills can be improved a lot by solving problems. Because it's so many times it happens that a player, especially when they're young, and also not only in chess, in other fields like my son, says, oh, no, this is not possible to solve it. No, this especially when he was smaller when he was eight, 10 years old. And I said, no, there is a solution to it, whether it's a chessboard or something else, you just have to have the perseverance for it and put the effort into it to find it. And this is what uh, increasing uh, the, the skills with the, with the study. But this one also, I think one of them, great examples of that. Yeah, I mean, actually it's true also in mathematics, which is my other area that if you, people sometimes look at the problem and say, oh, I can't do that. But and if you really look at it and tackle it and think about it more, suddenly you find the solution. So you know, chess and uh, mathematics both depend quite heavily on problem solving abilities. And yeah, as you say, having the determination to uh, look for something unexpected can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. OK, let's have a look, see what happens in this study. Well, um, why does I say, well, why actually threatening mate in one with rook to c8? Um, Black's best defence actually is to push the pawn, but I just want to give you a kind of preliminary idea of what might happen if black plays queen check, white now discovers check, it's a counter check, and black plays here and white takes the queen, but now black plays b2 check, and if white takes then the black king is rather unexpectedly stalemated, but actually white has a way out putting the king on b1, of course, also a stalemate. He plays his king to a2, black queens, and white can take with the rook, lifting the stalemate. So that isn't the main line, but it gives you some idea that um, black has this defensive possibility of playing the stalemate. So if we go back to the position, we can now see black's best defense, which is to give up the pawn in advance and get rid of it before he attempts to sacrifice the queen to get the same stalemate pattern. Now white has to play the right move. He has, of course, three choices. Um, let's see, for example, why playing the king here doesn't work. Black gives a check. Now we have the stalemate. Discover check from the rook. Rook takes queen. Stalemate. Doesn't work. So if we go back here, playing the king to a2 also doesn't work. Black gets rid of his pawn and then sacrifices his queen in exactly the same way. Discovered check and rook takes queen, it's stalemate. So the playing for stalemate forces white to choose the correct king move out of the three. Unfortunately, it's also the most obvious move. White just takes the pawn. Black tries to do the same thing. He gives a check, white gives discover check, and black plays for stalemate. But there's a crucial difference. Here the king is on b2 and the rook is on c2, as opposed to the king being on b1 and the rook on c1. And of course the black queen is on h2 rather than h1. So the three pieces on the second rank are here on the second rank, whereas in the previous variation they were on the first rank. And that makes a big difference because white now can win 
without immediately capturing the Black Queen. And the movie has to play is the highlight of the study. He plays Bishop D6. I think of this so movie. Brilliant. Like, yes, it's like a pair of scissors, you know, closing around the Black Queen, the Bishop and Rook. And the difference between having the pieces on the first rank is that when the Queen was on H1, the King on B1, Black had a check on E4 or on B7, which would save the day for him. Here, the Queen has no um, move which uh, gives check, apart, of course, from giving the Queen up. And the Queen is also unable to cover the mating possibility on C8. So Black's actually kind of finished here. He can limp on by giving up his Queen, but the resulting king and pawn ending is a simple win. White is in time to bring his king up and defend the pawn, after which I'm sure that you won't have any trouble seeing that uh, white can win. Perhaps I could just play out a few more moves to show people how this win works. For example, here, 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 white bottles the king up in the corner and not to bring the king to the f-file with stalemate, but first of all f6, and then king in, and white promotes the pawn with a quick mate. So that's just to show you how it would finish. It's not really part of the study because white has other ways to win. But like I say, the key move was, well, the key points here were white had to make sure that the pieces were on the second rank to cut out some of black's queen checks, and the spectacular move bishop d6 with a double attack on the black queen and, um, well, forcing black to give up his queen. So a... Uh, Shortish study, but with a lot of interesting tactics in it. Thank you for showing this study I, each time, and it's not the first time I'm seeing this. I'm just amazed with the beauty and the different uh, stalemate patterns and releasing the stalemate and the, the, the different lines where you can go wrong, right? That's also something important. Um, what is it for you when you compose? What is the process of that in your case? Does it take one week because you just have an idea and you develop it or it takes years or, or, or do you get the idea always by yourself or you're talking with people and you get something, you see a chess game and from there it starts developing? How does it go? Well, with me, there's no really fixed pattern. Uh, it always takes me quite a long time. I'm amazed at these composers who produce so many studies, like Pervikov or Minsky or Affect, they produce so many studies and always of good quality. And I think, well, how on earth do they do that? It's taken me like three weeks to do one study. And that's when I spend quite a lot of time on it. So I think they must be a lot more efficient. Um, my main problem is always getting the initial idea. Once I've got the initial idea, I find the process um, goes much more quickly. But uh, they seem to have an unlimited fund of ideas, whereas mine only comes slowly and painfully. <laughs> OK, I do hope that uh, once later on, you will also show some of your studies, because I know that you're a great composer yourself. But for now, this was it. We showed this beautiful uh, uh, example how artistic it can be a chess study and I would like to thank you John for being with me and we're going to be still continuing with another episode together thank you Julia